Well, glory to God, stand up with us and rejoice with us today. Amen. Lord, we just praise your name. We honor your name, Lord. King of kings, Lord of lords, what a delight it is to be in your house, to bring you praise, to bring you glory, to bring you all the honor, Lord, to lift up your name uh, in majesty, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this day. Have your way. Father, how we need you today. Lord, we just ask, Lord, that you will encourage each one, that you will minister to each one right where they are, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everyone said amen. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that guy away? It was my turn till I met. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn to laugh me through You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day Your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old me knew Jesus when I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. But you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Your love is the air and I'm breathing I have a future, my eyes are open And when you call my name I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You call my name Hallelujah. Give the Lord a shout of praise. Amen. Wow. Amen. It's so good to be in the Lord's house today. Amen. Amen. I wonder if we could do something totally different today. I know I'm about to change 
uh, kind of the flow. But could you take a moment right there where someone is close to you and just maybe give them an air high five and give them a, hey, good morning, how you doing, that kind of thing. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Every step. 
said, Yes, you are. Patient in every heartache. God, you have never failed. You won't stop with me. Oh, thank you, Lord. You said we will be there. Yeah. If you said it, we believe it. Yeah. Cause you're a man of your word. Yeah. If you said it, we believe it. Yeah. If you said it, we believe it. Yeah. Cause you're a man. Amen. Give the Lord a shout of praise in this place. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Do you believe that God can do anything you need? If he said it, then you can trust it and you can believe it. Hey, let's pray together as we uh, continue in our service this morning. Our Father, we just come to you now offering our thanks and our praise. We're here to worship you and to glorify you. We praise you that you are the God who can do the impossible. I'm asking that if anyone is here today who is feeling as though they're in an impossible situation, would you just push back darkness and let the light of your love just break through and shine in in great, great abundance. Oh God, our eyes are on you. We love you, we trust you, and we just, we, we mean it, God, with all of our hearts. We follow you, and, and we, we just adore you, God. You're the best thing that's ever happened in our lives. Thank you, God, for saving us. Thank you for redeeming us. All this we ask in Jesus' name. God's children said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated for just a moment. Um, I want to just say welcome. We're glad you're here with us this morning. And uh, if we didn't get a chance to meet, I'm Pastor Keith, and I think I've met most of you, if not all of you, uh, but I just want you to know that you can get connected with us if you text the word CONNECT to the phone number 602-833-0075. That screen will stay up there for probably about 20 seconds if you want to take a picture of it, and uh, that way it's just easy to remember and if you are a guest, oh, listen, welcome. We're so, so glad that you're with us. Uh, we're a church that exists to find purpose in Christ and share. And so we have found purpose in Him, and we share the journey together. We share the good news, and, and uh, we just, uh, we're just we so, so very glad to have guests with us today. Carrie, would you mind to put the guest phone number back up there just a moment longer uh, so that I see a, a few people grabbing phones and making sure they're getting it punched in correctly? I know that's a lot of numbers. If you're like me, you can't remember that many numbers, okay? So um, we're so happy you're with us. Also, we just want to say, if, if you don't want to do it that way, you can, uh, you can grab the Connect card that's on the worship guide. Uh, you should have received one when you came in this morning, and uh, we're so glad to have you with us. We're going to receive our tithes and offerings, and uh, we just encourage you to give generously from your heart. Um, if, if you have not done it yet, you can give digitally. Um, right now, during this stretch, we're not using our ushers to receive the offering, but rather we have a black box back there if you want to uh, write a check or give cash. There's envelopes there. You can fill out the information and put it right in that black box. It's safe and secure. Or you can give digitally if you go to bfachurch.org and just click on Give. It'll walk you right through all of the steps. And um, I want to just thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I did want to mention to you, I had said we would have a, a quick meeting at the end of church today to give you an update on our renovation and where we are in the process and the amount of money we've spent and what we anticipate. But there's just a couple of key things that I'm going to hold off until next Sunday. 
okay? And uh, I hope that just doesn't break your heart. You don't get to stay longer today. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry about that. But next Sunday, if you could uh, just plan to stay a few minutes extra, not long, just a brief update. And then if there's any questions, I'm going to try to say in that meeting, hey, come to me individually, call me individually. It's after church. It's lunchtime. We're not staying a long time, that sort of a thing, okay? Um, But I just wanted you to be aware of that. And um, I want to, as we're transitioning back to some more worship, we have, we have some uh, members of our church family that, that have needs. There's probably a dozen requests I could share with you. But I want us to pray right now for, for three in particular. Uh, for Dottie. We love, we love Miss Dottie. Um, Dottie's had some surgery this last week. It's a difficult recovery for her. And I want us to just pray for her today. Would you lift up Dottie? Also, Gordy's going in for knee replacement surgery tomorrow morning. And um, we're believing for God to be with Gordy. Um, There's a lot of prayer has gone into this. And I'm thankful that the Lord has opened the door and that this gets to happen. This needs to happen. We're praying for everything to go perfectly, to go smoothly. And then the other one I would mention, Daryl Hart is facing bypass surgery possibly this Wednesday, hopefully this week. Pray for Daryl. Um, that's, that's a biggie to go through. And so, in fact, as the team just starts to provide some worship music, I, I want to just lift up to the Lord those needs. And I'm sure you've got others that you'll add to it. But would you join with me? Our Lord, we just, we come to you Honoring that you are the highest one, the most high, and there's nothing you can't do. Thank you for being with Dottie through this surgery. Lord Jesus, please just give her a full recovery. Heal her body. She struggled a little bit, God. Give her strength today. Let a new wind come into her. Give her her second wind, a new energy, God. Give her the strength to recover and and to move forward. Let everything go perfectly on the healing process. Thank you for being with Gordy and Daryl this week as they've faced surgery. I just speak that they will not go into that operating room alone, but you will walk in with them. You have already gone before them, lining up just the correct surgical team and all of the equipment to work perfectly. Thank you for the doctors. God, thank you for their gifts. I pray that they just always use them for you. And I'm so glad that they can do things like this. We pray for healing, complete and total healing. Oh, God, thank you for being with Gordy. Be with Daryl. Bless their families, God. Take care of every need. And I'm sure, Lord, there are many requests right here in this room right now. Maybe our request didn't get to get mentioned out loud but you know all about it you care very much God so today Lord would you just like a loving father just sweep up your kids in your arms hold us close God let us know that you're walking with us and that you're for us and and that you take care of us praise your holy name hallelujah Oh, my Lord, 
stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keep light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Oh, He is the waymaker, miracle worker. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, 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 that is who you That is who you are. That 
Take this moment and, and pray with me. Pray for our nation. Those there was a there was a word that came forth. Pray for those that are not saved. Can we pray for those? You, everyone in here, we all know someone that does not know the Lord. Can we take a moment right now to call them by name and pray for them? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord. And Lord, we lift up those that do not know you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your amazing grace. I can honestly say, Lord, where, where would I be without your grace? You've been so kind, so merciful. And I'm asking today, Lord, that you will open the eyes of those that are lost those that do not know you. For your word says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I pray today, Lord, that there would be those that would come to know you, that would come to know your love, that would come to know your mercy, your grace. And today, they would say, you are Lord. Oh. Lord, I pray for my neighbors that don't know you. I I pray for my co-workers that don't know you. Lord, give me opportunity to speak life, to be your witness, Lord. I pray for their hearts even now, Lord, that you will prepare their hearts. We love you, Lord. We sing. Your love is unrelenting and never stops pursuing after me. Oh, sing that with me today. Your love is unrelenting and never stops pursuing after me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, your love is unrelenting It never starts pursuing after me Your love, your love, your love is unrelenting, Lord Oh, your love is unrelenting It never starts pursuing after me Can we sing? Sing, we're longing, we're longing Come on, sing it out Pursue me to me to face to face. We're desperate, so hungry. You're in this place. Oh, we're longing. Pursue me to me to face to face. Yes, we're desperate, so hungry. You're in this place. To me, to me, to face, to face We're desperate, so hungry You're in this place Yes, we're longing, pursuing To me, to face, to face We're desperate, so hungry of the things that we cherish in our church is praying for one another as the house lights come up I'm going to ask you something if you um, first let's have 
Everyone be seated. I think that'll make this this easier. If you have a prayer need, um, a concern, a request, a longing, maybe you can't even define it, but you just need something, you need a touch from God today. If that's you, would you stand to your feet right there? You just need prayer. You need God to do something for you. We just take a moment, look around the room, look at the ones who are standing. Those of us who are seated, would you join me? I want you to stretch your hand towards these ones. There's no distance with God. We believe in laying hands on people, but we're not laying hands on people. We're praying over people by stretching our hand their direction right now. In the name of Jesus, we praise you, God, that you take care of these requests. You know entirely what's going on, God. Lord, we're lifting our brothers and our sisters to you. There's an urgent need. God, there's a longing. There, there's something that needs your touch, and only you can do it, God. We just praise you that like you've said to us, Lord, that we are citizens of heaven. We belong to your kingdom. We're kingdom people. What privilege we have. So we speak as it is in heaven, so it is on earth. As it is done in heaven, so it is done on earth. These ones, we agree with them that everything they're asking for, they have in the name of Jesus. Everything they long for, they have in the name of Jesus. Lord, open up the windows of heaven and just pour out upon them blessings so great that they cannot even contain it. All to the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so let's just rejoice. Team, sing that again. Your love is unrelenting. And let's praise our God. Come on, if you just got prayer answered, give thanks to Jesus. Your love, Lord, your love, Lord, your love. Oh, praise you, God. It never stops pursuing after me. Oh, thank you, God. Your love is unrelenting. It never stops pursuing after me. We're longing. Oh, come on, saints. We're longing. We're longing. Pursuing to meet you face to face. We're desperate. So hungry. You're in this place. Longing, pursuing to meet you face to face. We're desperate, so hungry. You're in this place. It never stops pursuing after me. We heard an amazing telegram from heaven this morning. Um, by the way, if you're watching it on the live stream, there was a word that was just spoken here about our citizenship being in heaven. One of the things we're working on, we'd like to have, and we've actually got in our stock two microphones that can hang and be able to pick up things like that for the feed. We don't have that in place yet. But I so, so appreciated that word. We are citizens of heaven. Um, I want to ask Tammy to come up here, and I'm going to ask her to use a microphone. Tammy, I just love and respect so much. And, and um, she wanted to share something that the Lord put on her heart. Tammy, would you just, would you share?
but I started to have this just vision and it made me a remembrance of what it was like as a mom when I was mm. was playing with my children. And sometimes you play hide and seek and when you get behind a tree and you think you're hidden so well, you just start to get like, does, does anybody see me? Do you know where I'm at? And so you peek out and you think, the coast is clear. I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to run to that base. I'm going to be safe. And the next thing you know, mom or dad, they just kind of come in and they overtake you. You are seen. You are never hidden. <laughs> There's not one thing that blocks you from God's sight. He always sees you no matter where you are. And he is running with arms outstretched to overwhelm you and grab you with arms. And you are about to experience the joy of the Lord like you never have before when you look in your father's face and you see the smile and the delight and the love that he has for you. It will change your world. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I love the family of God. Just, um, you know, Ephesians 4 speaks of the equipping of the saints. And it talks about the family of God serving and pouring into one another. Uh, God's given leadership to the church, yes. But you guys, I love it. I love it when from within the assembly, just gathered together, God speaks to his people. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it amazing? Can we just say thank you to God for the way he's just ministered to us already here today? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we right now we're going to, um, uh, well, let me just first just say this. We, we want to recognize all of our veterans, and uh, this Wednesday is Veterans Day. It's kind of dicey, according to pastors. When do you celebrate? Do we do it next Sunday or do it this? And we chose to, to preempt it and get ahead of it, and, and I think most people are celebrating this this weekend. Um, this morning I woke up thinking about the people who have served our nation, and I'm, I'm thinking of soldiers who were ill-equipped, who, who did not have even the proper weaponry and didn't have uh, the right training, didn't even have the uniforms, who took on the British and were outnumbered two to one. And the bravery that they showed to stand for a nation, a brand new nation, where you could worship God according to the way that you wanted to worship Him, I'm thinking about our troops who stormed the beach at Normandy. Hundreds and hundreds of them gunned down. They must have known, heading onto the sand, you know what, many of us are not going to make it. But they gave the ultimate sacrifice, sacrifice because it was so important to them. I'm thinking of soldiers who came back from Vietnam and who were misunderstood and frankly mistreated and disrespected. There's, there's just no way to say thank you properly to our veterans. And so if you are a veteran, um, after this video plays, we're going to have you come down to the front and just line up across the front. We just want to say thank you. I looked for a gift. I don't have the money to buy you something nice. I thought, well, I could get them something cheesy, but that's not. The best thing we can do is just give them our thanks. And so, um, but this video, you guys go ahead and roll it. This is a tribute to all of our veterans today.
if you served, and listen to carefully how I say this, if you served in any of the branches of our military, or if your spouse served, or if your father or mother served, the immediate family, I want to invite you, would you come to the front and just line up right here across the front, all the way up across the front, and while they're walking up, can you just keep the thank you going? Come on, say a thank you to these ones who have served. Now let's get on our feet and say a real tribute. Thank you, veterans. Thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you so much for serving. We, we love you with all of our hearts. And today we're proud to be Americans. And we are proud that you have served. So as they're going back to their seat, tell them one more time how much you appreciate them. God bless you, veterans. Thank you. Well, I'm so excited to um, begin a brand new three-part series, and it is, um, it's titled Crash Scene, and it really takes us into the Thanksgiving season, so let's dive right in. Crash Scene, the last hours of Jesus' earthly life. Um, by the way, we're I'm looking at the cheat screen, and I don't know, earlier when Pastor Mo was singing, I saw it going green on it. I don't know what's happening. I, I remember one time Pete Silheimer was telling me about uh, out at Palo Verde, he said, you know, uh, I, he said, you want the smoke to always be white coming out of the plumes. And he said, if, if you look out there and it's green, that's a bad sign. And I said, well, what do we do if, if it turns green? He says, if it's green, it's too late. Don't worry. <laughs> So our screen was green. I was thinking, oh my goodness, is some Palo Verde happening or what's going on here? Um, crash scene. I, I wonder if you could just imagine what it'd be like if you were a witness to a car crash. Um, you know, this is a, the message today is, is really serious and to the heart. And just so you know what it's like being a pastor, last week's message was really hard on the delivery part. It was hard for me to l deliver. Today, it feels that way again. I like to, to tell funny stories and jokes and, and uh, to give commercial breaks along the way. Holy Spirit just has not allowed me to do that these two weeks. And, and so um, he did allow me to tell you one joke to start it off. Okay, So there was a, a pretty bad uh, car crash. And unfortunately, gentlemen... Uh, was was trapped and they had to get the jaws of life. They raised him to the hospital and he had severe damage to the arm. And doctor walks in and, and he says, hey, I've got some good news and some bad news. He says, um, well, well, doc, what, what's the bad news? Well, cut to the chase. What's going on? We can't save your arm. He said, you're, you're going to have to lose your arm. And, and oh, man, he said, doc, I love to play golf. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, what's the good news? He said, well, the good news is that um, we do have a, a transplant. We can give you another arm. It just so happens to be a lady's arm. And he said, you can do that? Well, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Uh, it, it's possible. So he said, well, will I still be able to play golf? And he said, sure, you, you can play golf. And, and so... They did it. It was a success. Amazingly, he now had a, a lady's arm. And about a year later, he saw the doctor out on the golf course. And he says, oh, doc, thank you. You saved my life. What would I have done And uh, without this arm? He says, oh, I'm so glad that the transplant was successful. You know, tell me about it. Talk to me. How's it going? He said, well, you know, I have noticed a, a few different things in my game. He said, you know, I don't, I don't have as much power as I used to have on my drive. 
But man, my short game is really good. He said, I've got a, a nice feel of the club. And I, I, just, I, I seem to just really be able to understand some of the nuances of the game like I hadn't. And, and uh, he said, well, have you noticed any other things? He said, well, I mean, my handwriting has got much better. It's more clear. He said, um, yeah, I mean, look at my scorecard. I mean, used to, the guys couldn't even read it, but just look at that penmanship. Isn't that awesome? He said, okay, okay. He said, well, any other things have happened since you had this arm transplant? And he, he said, well, some strange, bizarre sort of uh, symptoms that I can't really explain. Well, what do you mean? He said, well, like, for instance, this morning, I, I knew I had a 7.56 tea time, and I was trying to get in into the shop and get on time, but, but I knew that this club, they require a collared shirt, and, and I didn't have that on, so I was just going to run in the pro shop and grab a collared shirt. And I, I walked in, and, and I saw they had, immediately, I saw they had some nice choices. Now, ladies, before I finish the joke, Okay, husband, lean over and say, this isn't about you, okay? This is, this is just lighten up, lady. He's just having fun, okay? So I saw the shirts, and I thought, wow, well, those look nice. They've got a nice teal and a fuchsia. And, but, whoa, then I saw these really cute pants over there. And so I went to the pants, and I tried them on, and they, they all look nice. And, and then, oh, the hats, the hats that they had in the pro shop were just amazing. And, man, I just, I got it all. I mean, look at my golf cart. It's just full of all this stuff. Look at all these shopping bags. And the doctor said, that is amazing. How in the world do you afford all of that? And he says, oh, I just put it on the credit card. Well, that was the punchline. You guys, okay. Yeah, that's really bad. And this concludes the series crash scene, and uh, we'll move, no, okay. The last hours of Jesus' earthly life, just think of what it must have been like. It was a, it was a mean crash scene. It was a, a brutal crash scene. Um, just horrible. The worst you could ever imagine. He was betrayed by one of his own. He was falsely accused by the religious elite. He was arrested. He was beaten, ridiculed, and ultimately crucified. Those were the last hours of Jesus' life. But if you can, I want you to focus on that, um, that emblem that's on the door there of the ambulance. And uh, some of you will recognize the medical insignia. Uh, it's the serpentine symbol of healing, the universal symbol of medicine. Most people will tell you that it represents the rod of Asclepius, the Greek god of healing. Asclepius, who is mentioned by Homer in his Iliad in the 8th century BCE. And uh, then a couple of hundred years after that, a cult formed that followed him. Every medical professional takes the Hippocratic Oath. Um, and, and it plays off of this symbol. It has to do with the one who is wounded becoming the healer and uh, vowing to do good to everyone they treat and not to do harm to anyone they treat. Um, but actually, this symbol doesn't come from Asclepius. It dates much earlier than that. In fact, about the year 1400 B.C., um, Moses and the children of Israel are wandering through the wilderness and they're trying to make it to the promised land. And do you remember this story? Um, they're facing a plague and many people are dying. And they, they cry out to Moses, pray for us that we can be relieved from this plague. And Moses prays to God and God says to him, I want you to form an image, put a snake on the pole. The reason he said that is because venomous snakes had come into the camp and were biting people and they were dying. And um, so God says, I want you to form this image and everyone who looks at the image will live. And it was pretty incredible. You can just imagine what it was like. From that moment, they, they looked to the image and 
and they were healed. It was a true miracle. A, a real mystery, right? I mean, things that are going on there that we, we kind of don't understand all of it. Um, but the Israelites quickly asked for relief from the plague, and so many were dying, but Moses prays on their behalf, and God gave them a particular set of instructions. He said, um, make a snake, put it on a pole. Anyone who's bitten and looks at it will live. Um, in 1866, Gustave Doré drew this Bible illustration of it. It's called The Brazen Serpent. He was a famous French artist. He did a lot of Bible illustrations. Um, I don't know that he's got it right, but part of it is right. This image must have been big. It must have been huge because all of the millions of Israelites had to be able to look upon it. And actually, if you know the story, it really became a stumbling block, didn't it, for Israel? It became, um, you know, an idol. They looked to that idol instead of looking to God. And, and it, it, really, um, it really was a bad thing. But it is a picture of Jesus who would become sin, would become very sin for us, and be raised up on a pole to offer his life to save, to save us. Um, the crash scene. I don't have to tell you that the disaster piece turned into a masterpiece with Jesus. He turned the gory into glory. Jesus turned the crash scene into a crush scene because he crushed the enemy. Amen. Have you had a crash scene in your life? You look around and you think there's no hope. You're left trying to pick up the pieces. It's a mean crash scene. Just like a, a crash, a car crash, there were witnesses to Jesus' death. And that's really what we're going to be looking at over these three weeks, the, the final hours of Jesus' earthly life. And uh, the gospel writers, each one of them wrote from their own vantage point. And so sometimes we can fall into a trap of thinking of the Bible this way. We sort of think, well, the Bible is, you know, a, a manual. It's some sort of court deposition. And so uh, we, we can get trapped by thinking it's supposed to be a clinical expose and everything in it is supposed to match perfectly. And sometimes that doesn't happen. For instance, you read one of the four gospels and you notice that it has a little bit different wording from one of the other gospels. And so the naive ignore it and just go on their way. The skeptics dismiss it out of hand. They say, well, you know, we've always doubted Christianity. Aha, it's a hoax, and this proves it. But the prudent ones investigate it and see what's actually going on. A crash scene is a good analogy to describe it because... Just imagine if, if there were a crash down here at Yuma and Watson Road, and let's say four different witnesses were standing there, one on each corner, and they each watched that crash, they would each notice certain things that happen and have a different viewpoint from the other guy. And that's sort of what goes on with the gospel writers. They're writing from their perspective all the information they can pull together to bring it together to give their description. In this series, over these three Sundays, we're going to look at three different elements of each crash scene in the end of the life of Jesus Christ, and we're going to look at them from different angles of the witnesses. And I chose this series, um, Crash Scene. Long before I knew of the election in our nation, but I do think it's appropriate today. Our nation is hurting. Hey, what we're celebrating is more people voted than any time in history. That's amazing. But you know, there's a lot of pain in our nation. But God is 
going to come into our crash scene, and it's a pretty mean crash scene right now. But God has already confirmed in this gathering this morning that he's bringing his healing. So now the sermon today is titled, War Sabers Are Rattling. It comes from an article by Philip Yancey in Christianity Today way back in January of 2003. More on that in just a few minutes. But I want to talk to you for just a moment about this, this question. What's up with the sword? Jesus, what is up with the sword? So you got Matthew on one corner. I'll say Mark. He's known as John Mark on the other corner. Um, Mark, by the way, was heavily influenced by Peter. And then you've got Luke's observation. John, on yet another perspective. Luke, the historian, the, um, the researcher, he writes something that Matthew, Mark, and John do not even write about. And here it is. It's Luke chapter 22. And I'm going to read this. I won't read all of the verses uh, throughout the sermon, just kind of allude to them as they come on the screen. But this I want you to see. But he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. And then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. What he's talking about is when he sent them out by groups of two and he sent 70 individuals out to, to minister in the surrounding areas. He said, did you, did you lack anything? No, we didn't lack anything. You took care of every need. Verse 36, he said to them, but now, but now, if you have a purse, take it and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. Now, I'm just going to tell you straight up, I don't understand everything about this passage. I read a lot of different opinions. There's, it's all over the map. Some people say that this is Jesus saying it's okay to pack and carry and to take up arms. And then there's all the way from that to some people saying Jesus is trying to teach us something, but it's not about violence. I'm not sure who's correct. Uh, here's the thing about this. Um, I, I read and read and I prayed and prayed, Lord, help me to understand this. It is remarkable how many people don't know what it's about. And I'm in pretty good company to not know the answers. But I will tell you this. Jesus said, this must be fulfilled in me. There was something going on here. There was something that needed to be fulfilled, and, and he's fulfilling it. And um, Now, what written language doesn't do for us, typed letters, ink on paper, print on a digital device, it can be accurate, it can have the correct words, um, it can give a a lexicon of the word, you know, the, the meaning of the word. It, it can follow correct syntax so that it, it reads well and it is grammatically correct. But what it can't do for us, written language can never give us things like voice inflection or facial expression or tone gestures. So I want you just to look at verse 38, Jesus' words, that's enough, for instance. Let's take that for a moment. First off, the exclamation point is not part of the original text it's added. It's probably accurate, I would say, but that's an addition. And it had to be provided by the translators. So when they said, Jesus, we've got two swords, did Jesus respond? Hey, that's enough. That'll do. 
Sort of like it just comes off like um, that, that Jesus would be saying, hey, that should work. Two of them, that ought to be enough, don't you think? Hey, uh, good job. Way to go, guys. Good job, disciples. Now, that would just be an odd statement. Would two swords be enough to face Rome? I mean, I don't think so. He's going to be facing an angry mob, certainly. Would Jesus really think that two swords would be enough? But I mean, this is Jesus we're talking about. He fed five loaves with uh, 5,000 with just five loaves and two fish. So maybe two swords is enough. Or, or did Jesus say, now, hey, you guys, come on, that's enough now. <laughs> that's enough. You know, lighthearted, jovial tone. Hey, Lord, we got a couple of swords here. Oh, you guys, you're always kidding. Well, I don't think that he would have just such a jovial tone as he's moving towards such a serious event like the cross. That doesn't seem to fit. Is there another way to read this? Or did Jesus say, that's enough? Rough tone. I've heard all I want to hear on this topic. You missed it entirely. You thought I was serious? That, that's enough. We don't know. It would come off sort of like, like Trump saying, hey, I was, dr- I was joking when I said drink bleach for a cure. It would, it would be like he's saying, look, you know me. You know how I've ministered among you three and a half years. I'm not really wanting you to get swords together. That's enough. I remember an episode of Brady Bunch. That's the era I grew up in. Mike is getting on to little Bobby, the youngest son. And he gets very firm. He says, now, Bob, that's enough. I remembered that always. Was that what Jesus was doing? Had he been misunderstood? One funny story that we have from the prison when Zach was out here at Buckley Unit in, in, uh, in Buckeye Prison at Lewis. You know, he was... He was respected as the pastor on the yard and um, would have guys come up to him and ask for prayer and he'd pray for them and different things. And, and he, he was known just to lead men to faith in Christ. He led the Bible study. And so um, one of the guys that got saved, Edgar, former Mexican mafia, he's a bad dude. He's got a scar all the way up in here from being speared and he'd been 19 years in the prison system at the point that he got delivered from drugs. God took it from him, became a follower of Christ. Edgar gets saved, and then Tony, Tony's a white guy with a swastika, a swastika easy for you to say, tattooed on top of his head. He's uh, Aryan supremacy, and he's like white race, and, and he's got a big Adolf Hitler tattoo, Heil Hitler on, the, on his back all the way from his neck down to his waist. And he got saved, and Edgar and Tony become buddies, and they're, they are now, in fact, became cellmates. They're serving Jesus together, still to this day, serving the Lord side by side. Amazing. But, but one day what happened was, uh, Zach's out in the yard, and, and there was a particular officer. Not all the officers are this way. They, sometimes they get a, a, a bad reputation. I respect those guys so much, but this particular one, really, really had a bad attitude, and, and there's a, an inmate who's in a wheelchair, and the inmate admittedly is very annoying. He really is annoying. I mean, he's just, he's annoying, you guys. He's always talking smack and just, boy, and so the officer is, is taking him down the sidewalk, and he's just had enough, and he just, he wheels him off the sidewalk and lets him roll into the fence, and the the wheelchair falls over and the guy falls out on the floor, on the ground. And, and it, it was pretty rough. And, and Zach is standing there with Edgar and all the guys back behind him. And, and he says, man, that's harsh. We got to do something about that. And what he meant by it was somehow we have to show that guy true love and, and both the officer and, and the, the inmate and, and sort of bring them around, bring some reconciliation, somehow get some respect for him, show him how to be just a better person. But Edgar, former Mexican mafia, he says, okay, brother Zach. And he starts signaling on the yard. And all of a sudden, 
Zach looks around and you've got guys like gathering and they're, I mean, they're getting ready to go to blows. I mean, they're grabbing stuff and, and Zach looked at him and said, Edgar, what, what are you doing? He said, well, you said we have to do something. No, 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 no. I didn't mean that. I mean, we need to show the love of Christ. And Edgar's, Edgar goes, oh, oh, okay. Hey, hey, guys. Shh, shh. <laughs> did that happen? Did, did Jesus get misunderstood? Was he saying, I didn't really want you to grab swords? I don't know that we can know. But in one sense, we don't have to be left guessing because just a few verses later, um, down at verse number 49, Jesus and his, what's going on here is his, his followers have followed him into the, uh, into the garden to pray and the, the uh, betrayer comes with a whole entourage. I mean, Judas leads people with clubs and swords and they've got lanterns. They're coming in the middle of the night. And um, just this interesting thing happens here where uh, one of them says, Lord, should we use our swords? And one of them, and it's Peter, and we know this, one of them takes his sword and he cuts the ear off of the, of the soldier. And Jesus, his response to this, uh, he says, no more of this. He says, and, and, and by the way, no more of this as he's picking up an ear and putting it back on his head and healing the man. And, and he says, um, am I leading a rebellion that you come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts. You did not lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Just what is it that Jesus is trying to show us about this mysterious sword? Because I know that sometimes when I read the Bible, do you ever read it and go, wow, the disciples, they're, they're dense. They don't get it. And then like when I read this, this week I was going, I am so dense. I, I don't get it. Lord, it seems like in one instance you're saying, take up your sword, but in the next instance, put away the swords. I don't want any swords. Do you think I'm serious about the sword thing? What is he trying to teach us? So much room for interpretation. Could it be that in this weak moment, Jesus actually for a moment in his weakest part of his humanity was, attempted, was tempted to lead a coup attempt? But he's so in control at every other time, all the way through the crucifixion. I just think most likely there's got to be some deeper meaning. There's something that just escapes us. And so here's something that's really interesting. Matthew 10, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. Lord, I thought that's what you were all about. I thought you were going to bring peace. I mean, for Pete's sake, you're the prince of peace. We want peace and we want it now. No, no, no. He says, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. I mean, that is such an oxymoron. It is the opposite of what you would ever expect. The member of your own household to be a, a sword dividing you between you and your family, that's, none of us want that ever. A sword. He doesn't mean that we always have to have a division in our family. That's not what he's saying at all. He wants every individual to serve him, but he's asking for commitment, no matter what it costs. Even if it costs us our most prized possessions, it may cost us everything. The sword divides, the sword demands, the sword is the litmus test of our faith. I can just hear Jesus saying, sure, you can serve me when everything's going well. That's easy. Will you serve me when it hurts? Will you serve me when the sword divides? War sabers are rattling. There is a war for humanity. 
You see, this sword that Jesus is talking about is the disruption that his presence creates. It happens. It's inevitable. Jesus has split families, neighborhoods, nations. This week, I read the story of Kiyoma Yumiyama. This is a picture of him in the 60s with Thomas F. Zimmerman. Zimmerman, the general superintendent of the assemblies here in the United States. Yumiyama, general superintendent of Japan. Get this, he lived for more than 100 years. He lived 102 years. He was born in 1900 and he died in 2002. Now, just think about this for a moment. If he had been born a year earlier because of the way he straddled the century, he actually could have lived in three separate centuries, the 19th to the 21st. Let me tell you his story. When Kiyoma was a teenager, a man was selling New Testaments in the village where he lived on the island of Shikoku. He bought one of them, but he didn't read it. Soon there was a friend at high school who preached Christ to his fellow classmates. And Kiyoma always would listen to him and pay careful attention. And that happened several different times. Well, several years passed, and he was called to the bedside of his dying sister. His sister was dying from a disease, and he watched her ebb away. And it was then that he started thinking, I wonder what happens after we die. And for some reason, he remembered that book that he bought back in high school. So then he takes it out and he started to read it. And then he went off to college to study medicine. And, and while he was there, um, he's walking along one day and he sees a sign that says gospel mission. He didn't really know what that meant, but he understood the word gospel. He had read that in the book. And so he went into the gospel mission. And when he went inside, he talked with him, and he found all the answers to all the questions that he had always been longing to know. He asked Jesus to be his Lord and his Savior. He moved to Tokyo to continue his education, studying medicine. But one day, he's walking outside the Tokyo Gospel Hall, and he felt drawn to go inside there, and he met John and Esther Jurgensen. And he had questions for them about Pentecostalism. He had been hearing about Pentecostalism, and what does that mean? And so John and Esther sat with him, and they showed him from the Scriptures this wonderful experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And in their living room, they laid hands on him and prayed over him, and he began to speak with other tongues as he was gloriously filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Soon... He felt the call of God on his life to preach the gospel. He walked away from medical college. His parents disowned him. His parents did not approve. You are not part of our family any longer. But he followed God's call into the ministry and in 1927, when the first Assemblies of God Church was formed in Japan, Yokoyama was the pastor. And he remained the pastor for 25 years. And his church was spared destruction in World War II when most of Tokyo was wiped out by bombs. Miraculously, his little church stood and stayed. And in 1949, finally after all these years, the Assemblies of God was formed in, to in Japan. And so he became a prominent leader. He was the very first general superintendent of the Assemblies of God in Japan. And he, he was also the president of Central Bible College in Tokyo. He did that for more than four decades. Listen, this precious brother in Christ, Kiyomo Yakiyama, he was betrayed by his family. They disowned him. He lost everything, but he followed Christ and literally thousands and thousands of people are in the kingdom today because he followed Jesus. 
I wonder if this isn't the sword that Jesus is saying to us to take up. I can't emphasize this enough. If you were raised in a family in which you learned about Jesus Christ and how to love him and how to serve him, you have no idea how blessed you are. How rare you are in the earth. You are highly favored. Please don't take that for granted. Mo and I were blessed with the best dad and mom. Mo, sometimes I stop and think about it. All five of us boys are serving Jesus. What a, what a blessing. What a miracle. The story of the sword, it goes both ways back to Jesus' birth. And even before that, Luke, none of the other witnesses, but Luke wrote down the words of Simeon to Mary. And by the way, I love the ironies that are embedded in Luke's Christmas story. While news of Elizabeth's upcoming birth and her pregnancy, it just spread like wildfire. It was such good news. Everyone rejoiced and her son was born and for a while he was just a rock star. John became a local hero. Everyone celebrated it. But her cousin Mary, poor Mary, had to slip out of town to avoid the ugly accusations from the gossipers. And her son would be chased out of neighborhoods by a murderous crowd. And the old man, Simeon, said these words to Mary, A sword will pierce your own soul too. I wonder what she thought as she stood at the foot of the cross and watched her, her son giving his lifeblood, an innocent man, never sinned, but he's laying down his life for the, for the hope of humanity. I wonder if she felt that dagger in her very soul. Here's some things that I want you to take away today, just three observations. When Jesus is introduced to our lives, it brings disruption. Now, that sounds so harsh, but it's the reality. He disrupts the Holy One, Jesus, and the evil one, Satan, do not make very good roommates. And when he comes to live in your heart, it's going to bring some changes. Following Jesus means disruption to everything. Nothing is off limits. He is not Lord of all unless he is Lord over all. And if he is not Lord of all, then he's not Lord at all. And number two, Jesus is more interested in your salvation than your comfort. So many times we picture Jesus as gentle and courteous. And he, uh, he almost always is. Uh, he, he can be so gentle and... And I'm convinced he prefers to be gentle. In fact, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for it is light. My burden is easy. I am gentle and humble in heart. But he will allow us great discomfort to bring us to a place of his overcoming grace. And like Michael Robertson said two weeks ago, right here in this podium, he said, David had to have his Goliath. It was necessary. He said, Jesus had to have his Judas. It was necessary. Third thing, you yourself choose to unsheathe this sword. Jesus said to his followers, you take the purse, you take the, the bag, you take up the sword. He doesn't force you to take it. But to the brave and to the adventurous, he says, are you willing to part with your creature comforts to experience the sharp edge of his blade which will untangle you from all of your traps? 
His sword is sharp and it cuts away excess. And so for me, this week has been pretty painful. And even again this morning um, in prayer, trying to grow and realizing, oh Lord, I've got a long way to go. You're going to have to work on me some more. There's some more surgery that you need to do. Take your sword and cut things out that you don't want. And I, I think for us as a church family, and for us as a nation, in fact, what, what we desperately need is to present ourselves to him and say, Lord, it's frightening and it's scary to pray this way, but just take your sword and cut off anything that you don't want in me. Cut off all the excess so that I can be like you. I, I want to ask our team to come back and lead us in, in some, some worship. Just, Pastor Mo, however you feel led. And I want to ask you to truly, right where you are, have an altar call. Right there where you are. You may even want to kneel at your chair or you might want to stand and just respond but let's let this message be solidified in our hearts as we present ourselves to our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ I don't want to lock us into anything Pastor Mo by the way thank you for your leadership I love you so much you're such a gracious leader and you know things that Nobody else knows about me, <laughs> and um, I love you so much. And I, want, I, ju I just want you to lead us, and um, I want you to respond, and when we're done, we're done. Mo, why don't you just lead us in prayer when it feels right to you, and that's how we'll end today. Find a place to be with God. Amen.
today, Lord, except that you go with us, Lord. We don't want to leave this place. So we ask, Lord, that you would go with us. Lord, we're asking for the comforter to come alongside of us. We're asking for the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to come right beside us, Lord. Walk with us, Lord. Every day this week, Lord. Oh, every day this week, Lord. When I lay my head down to sleep, Lord, when I wake in the morning, let the name of Jesus resonate in my heart and my spirit. May I be reminded, Lord, that I am a citizen of the kingdom of God. I ask for your blessing on each one, Lord, each household, each family member. There are some that are not able to be here today, Lord. We ask today you touch them in body, Lord. You'll raise them up, Lord. They will be strong in the name of Jesus, I pray. I thank you for it, Lord. We bless your name, Lord. 